Well, good morning. Hey, it's so good to be with you today. And uh, if you're a guest with us for the first time, we're glad you're here. Or if you've called this place your home for a bit, we're glad that you're here too. And you're coming at a good time. We're starting this series entitled You Asked For It. And I got to tell you, uh, we thought this series was a great idea a few months ago. And then we got your questions. Um, and you all have some good questions. Um, we had over 100 different questions uh, covering many, many different aspects of the Bible and God and faith and Jesus and all these different things. And uh, so I'm coming back from vacation, and the two questions I'm dealing with today, uh, trying to help us just point in the right direction, are some big questions. But when we asked our Treehouse kids and our students and our adults, um, uh, we had over 100 questions. Our kids asked questions like this, God, what's your favorite color? Are there other dimensions? Uh, can I find a real unicorn with wings and a horn? Are there dogs in heaven? Uh, why are my brothers so annoying? Can we get an amen to that? You felt that before. Um, but our kids also ask questions like this. Uh, Jesus, when are you coming back? Why did you make a rule that Adam and Eve couldn't eat the fruit from the tree? Why did my loved one pass away and will I see them again? When will I stop being afraid? I think it's amazing that even at the age of children, we see this inquisitive nature with human beings. Don't you see that? Like we're always asking questions. We have this, this propensity to ask questions and we're trying to put our hands around faith in God and everything we can. And it's not as if we get older and our questions go away, right? Like all of us would say that if we get older, our questions spawn more questions. We have more questions and there's layers to questions and all these offshoots because we're trying to merge our real life experience with what God is saying in the Bible. And so we find ourselves asking questions. I find myself asking questions like, God, if God is good, how do bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people? What will the end times look like? What's heaven look like, hell look like if they're real? How can my marriage be brought back to health if it just is falling apart? How can I forgive someone who's wronged me deeply? We have these questions and all of them in between. And so I just want to say a few things before we dive in. Our hope for this series is that we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, and I just want to do something real quick. Can everybody just, just, just like take a nice easy breath, just go, oh. And what I want you to do that is because I think a lot of times we feel this pressure when we come into questions like this because they're so big. And so I just want to say at the very beginning, uh, we are heading into this with a lot of humility, and we're trying to treat each other with kindness. And so chances are there's going to be things that, that we don't do perfectly here. There's going to be things that, that we don't do perfectly, but we're, we're trying really hard for God's word to be the guardrails of our conversation, for the Holy Spirit to be our guide, and for us to be able to be pointed in the right direction that we're not going to solve every single issue today. But we're hoping it spurs more conversation and that we're encouraged and challenged in our faith. There's going to be things that you hear throughout the series, and you're going to be encouraged because you're going to go, man, those convictions I have, those beliefs that I have, you know, what, what we've been learning, it, it encourages me in my faith, my convictions. And there's going to be things that challenge you and push you. And you're going to go, hold on a second. I've never read that scripture before. I've never heard that before. And I think that that's actually the perfect place for a Christian to be continually encouraged and challenged in their faith, always pushing us beyond the assumptions we have about God, faith, the Bible, but always encouraging us in who we are in Christ and that God loves us, God's for us. So that's my hope uh, as we go through this series is, is really that we head into this with humility. And um, you know, I'll tell you, there's a weight that comes with trying to prepare for something like this because I know I'm going to make some people mad and I'm going to make some people happy and I could make the same people happy and mad at the same time with different questions. So it just means my inbox is going to get really full this week. Um, but I want to say a few things, and then we're going to dive into the questions. Uh, the point of this is not simply to gain knowledge, okay? This is not a seminary where we're trying to just teach knowledge. The point of this is, is really for us to have a heart of wisdom. And wisdom is different than knowledge. Wisdom applies to situations. It's real life. It's happening right here and right now. And so really what we want to do is we, we, instead of just trying to get information download, we, we want our, our hearts and our minds to, to be aligned with Jesus, that we have a close relationship with Jesus, a close union with Jesus, that we live and act and breathe and think like Jesus did. I love what James 1.5 says. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And that's our heart as we tackle these questions. 
Uh, the truth is we don't have time to address every single question that you all have asked. We had over 100 questions. And I started off this weekend and I said, I'm going to answer four questions really well. And then I started writing and I was like, oh, I'm going to answer three questions really well. And now I'm going, I'm going to try to answer two questions really well. Um, but I want to make you a promise. Um, as we go through this, if we don't answer the question that you have been wrestling with, thinking through, uh, right now on the slide, you're going to see my email. Uh, jot that down. You can find it on the website. If we do not answer your question in this series, if you send me an email after the series and say, I've been wrestling with this, I've been thinking about this, I promise you that I will either send you a thoughtful response back via email or I'll say, hey, why don't we grab coffee and we'll talk about it. That's my promise to you. It might take me time if I get 100 emails. So give me some grace. But I promise you that really we want this to be a space for us to be able to ask questions. There's, a, there's space. There's, it's permission to be able to wrestle with things because I think it's the good, good position to be in. Um, and I will keep your questions confidential. So if there's something you're wrestling with, I know we got some questions that were very, very personal in nature. And uh, I want you to know that I'll keep your questions confidential. And I'll either email your response quickly or, or I'll uh, schedule a time to, to get together with you. Uh, so we're tackling two questions today, and, you know, they're easy ones. Uh, the first one is, what does the Bible say about women in church leadership? What does the Bible say about women in church leadership? You know, I get this question a lot, and I get it because of the way that we lead here at River Tree. We have women in all different seasons and parts of leadership here at the church, and the truth is it's a, it's a topic and a question I've wrestled with personally on my own. Um, when I accepted Jesus into my life when I was 17 years old, I started attending this church, um, and the church I was attending had very, very strict interpretations and application for the role of women in church leadership. Women couldn't be preaching, women couldn't be elders, women couldn't serve communion, women couldn't really be on stage. Um, and the reasoning for that was primarily from Paul's words in 1 Timothy 2. So I want to turn there just for a moment. Paul writes, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, if you read these words, at first glance, it just seems like the conversation's done, right? They're very blunt. I mean, it just seems like Paul's saying to Timothy in the church in Ephesus, I don't permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, and his argument is bound in creation, uh, basically saying that Adam wasn't the one who was deceived first. It was Eve. Adam was, uh, was formed first. Um, in Paul's words discussing the qualifications of elders and overseers, Paul concludes that elders should be exemplary family men who are faithful to their wives and they care for their kids. And you'll see that in Titus 1, 6 and 1 Timothy 3, 2 and 4. But the same Paul who writes these things down is the Paul who mentions a lot throughout his writings women who are in leadership roles throughout the church. And I want to cover a few of those. Um, we see in Romans 16.1, uh, there is this passage where Paul mentions a lot of women who are co-workers with him in uh, the good news of Jesus. In 16.1, it, it says, uh, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Censore. I ask that you receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help that she may need from you, for she has been the be benefactor of many people, including myself. So Paul refers to this woman named Phoebe as a diakonos, a deacon. Um, it can be translated as a deacon, a minister, or a servant. And a lot of people um, take this to be a, a title. Uh, it's a, she's in a position of a deacon. Um, he uses the exact same word, diakonos, to refer to himself, to refer to himself in Apollos, who was a Christian preacher, and to refer to himself in Timothy, Timothy, his protege. Um, and I think we've got the scriptures on there, um, so you, you can see those if you're interested in, in that word usage. But Phoebe financially supports Paul. She is funding his ministry, and what we see too when we look at Jesus is that there's women who are financially supporting Jesus' ministry as well. Uh, she was responsible for not just financially supporting his ministry, but she was also delivering the book of Romans to the Roman churches at that time. Now, when I say delivering, I don't mean United States Postal Service, right? Her job was not to just take the book and run it there. Um, someone at that time, in the role that she was in, she would take Paul's writings, 
she would go to these churches, and there were churches of 20 to 50 people, much different than today, right, because Christianity was, was under persecution in Rome. And so she would go from church to church in these homes, and she would basically preach or share Paul's words to these Christians. And in the meantime, people would ask questions. It's different than today where it's kind of like I talk and just people listen. Um, it'd be, it'd be kind of like I'm talking and someone would go, hey, hold on a second. Hold on, that, that's BS. What are you saying there, right? So they would ask questions. It was interactive. And that's what Phoebe would do. Is she was performing this, this beautiful letter of Romans to all these different Christians throughout Rome. Uh, she was a messenger, an emissary. There is a husband-wife duo called uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and they are called companions or co-workers with Paul. In fact, in Acts 18, 24 to 26, it tells us that Priscilla and Aquila, this husband and wife uh, duo, uh, taught a man named Apollos. And Apollos was this Christian preacher, really well known. Paul mentions him and says, I'm not as eloquent as Apollos. Apollos was very persuasive. But it says that Priscilla and Aquila taught Apollos in the ways of God. Apollos would later become this well-known preacher alongside Paul, and it's possible from what we read in Romans 16, 4 and 1 Corinthians 16, 19, that both Priscilla and Aquila were actually church planters. They hosted a church in their home, and in that kind of way, they would kind of co-lead. In Colossians 4, 15, Paul shares the following greeting. He says, give my greetings to the brothers and the sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And so we see this woman named Nympha who hosted a church within her home. And in Roman times, hosting a church in your home was kind of a de facto leadership role. The householder uh, had significant sway over uh, what the Christian church in their home did and, and the vision and the mission of that church. In Acts 21.9, Paul stays with a man named Philip. And Philip has four daughters who are called prophets. And in Romans 16.7, we read this. Uh, Paul gives this greeting. He says, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ Jesus before I was. So here, Paul mentions this husband and wife duo named Andronicus and Junia who have been in prison with Paul, and they actually believed in Jesus before Paul did, and he notes that they are outstanding or distinguished among the apostles. They're really good apostles, not just apostles, but outstanding, distinguished, well-known apostles, um, which clearly in the New Testament, the term or the position apostle was like the highest title in the early church. So what are we to do? We have some seemingly, you know, texts that seem to restrict the role of women in church leadership, and, and then we see some texts where it seems to encourage them. And I want to say a few things before we dive in. Uh, the first is this. In the Christian faith, there are some things that I would call essentials. Essentials to the Christian faith. They are, they are bedrock, they're foundation to the Christian faith. And the truth is, those are few and far between, far between. They center mostly, if not all the time, around who Jesus is and Jesus' work in the cross and in the resurrection. And the truth is, this conversation about the role of women in church leadership, I would not refer to as an essential. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that a woman preaching is sinful. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that a woman leading in some element of the church is sinful. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that a woman being an elder is sinful. Um, I know good, passionate, faithful followers of Jesus who land on both sides of this conversation. And that's the tension that I feel internally is I know people who are educated and have PhDs and are really well-known and they, I mean, all these things, and they land on both sides. I know people who seek God's wisdom and they're prayerful people, and they land on both sides of this question. And so my opinion, for what it's worth, as is evident in the way that we lead here at River Tree, is that the restrictions that are given in 1 Timothy 2 are dealing with specific circumstances that are going on in the time of the church in Ephesus, mainly false teaching. Uh, for, throughout 1 Timothy, uh, Paul mentions three times the phrase false teaching, and he warns Timothy to be aware of false teaching. And in a world where the vast majority of people were illiterate, it's different than today, the majority of people were illiterate, um, and in a world where the majority of women were not formally educated, I think, and it's again, it's, a, it's, a, it's what I interpret it to be, 
Paul's concerned that with this newfound freedom in Christ, remember this is the same Paul who said there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, everyone is one in Christ. That Paul is concerned that with this newfound freedom in Christ, there are going to be women who aren't educated and haven't had the best role models when it comes to being a woman in leadership. They've seen all kinds of of bad examples with that, with temple prostitutes and Ephesus, that they would begin teaching and preaching in ways that would be harmful and detrimental to the church, that they would start having this negative impact on the communities they are part of. I see this text as more corrective than it is didactic in that it's dealing with real problems at that time. And I think that the real problem that we see is that there's problems with worship and preaching. There's concerns about false teaching and pointing people astray. And we have to remember that this culture was deeply patriarchal, meaning that men ran the show. I mean, it was basically a, a, a men ran culture. And so I think it's important to understand that Paul's writings, where he mentions a woman apostle, And he mentions a woman deacon, and he talks about women church planters and how a woman taught Apollos and women co-workers. In my opinion, and again, it's just my opinion, it shows us this trajectory of how women, uh, we were moving from this gender-based roles where men could do these things and women could do these things to spirit-based roles where we say the Holy Spirit has gifted men and women with gifts to be used for the church, to join God's mission. And there might be some women that are gifted in teaching and preaching, and they should use that gift for the betterment of the church. And there might be women who aren't gifted with preaching and teaching, and they shouldn't preach. The same, a man shouldn't preach. We shouldn't just put a man on stage because we go, yeah, he's a man. Um, He should have the gift of preaching and teaching to be used for the church. And so, um, you know, I know that everybody won't agree with that, and that's okay. Um, I truly believe it's okay. I think that there's going to be topics that we talk about, whereas brothers and sisters in Christ, we're not always going to be on the same page. We're going to wrestle with our interpretation. We're going to wrestle with the way that we see things, our life experiences, and I think that that's okay. But rather than lead us to divisiveness and or to leaving the church altogether, which I've seen happen at times, I think what it can do is lead us to deeper conversation and sharing life experiences and deeper study and sharing uh, tensions that we have and questions we have, because I think all of us have those tensions and questions, and I think all of that is a good thing. Okay, so that is my take on the role of women in church leadership. Now we turn to a softball question. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? Um, You know, the truth is uh, we're just going to be able to, to scratch the surface on this conversation because uh, it's huge and it's important. And um, I don't know about you, but this question has been something I've wrestled through myself because uh, one of my closest friends is gay. And even this question of what does the Bible say about homosexuality spurs more questions, like what's the Bible say about being gay? Is a person born that way? How should I feel about myself if I have same-sex attraction? Should I go to a same-sex wedding if my friends are getting married. Anybody felt that tension before? I've felt that. Is the LGBTQ community welcome at River Tree? There's a weight that comes with this discussion. And it's a weight that all of us feel to some degree. And me trying to communicate something to you, I feel it to a different degree. Um, you know, I prayerfully headed into this morning going, well, I know I'm probably going to make some people mad. And, uh, but I'm going to try to be faithful to what God says. And, uh, And I think a lot of this circles around, these are real people that we're talking about, right? I mean, this isn't just an issue. This is real people. So I want to go into answering this question with a lot of humility. I'm not able to answer every single question, um, but trying to say a few things that I think point us in the right direction. And uh, before we dive in, I want to say a few things, uh, just preliminary things, before we dive into the scriptures that talk about homosexuality. Um, As we have this conversation uh, about homosexuality, um, the truth is we're coming at this from all different angles, okay? So I know that. I know that people have different political backgrounds and different experiences and agendas and, uh, I mean, perspectives of life. I know that. I have a perspective in life. And as we do that, I think it's essential that we understand that when we talk about this, we're not talking about an issue to be discussed and decided. We're talking about people to be loved. Can we all just say amen to that? That's what we're talking about here. Okay, Um, this is a fundamentally Christian approach to this conversation. 
when we start getting into the politics of it and this hot, you know, hot button issues and it starts getting really seated and the, the tension goes up, the Christian approach to this is saying, this is not some issue to be discussed and decided. We're talking about people who are loved by Jesus. And if we start the conversation there, I think we get a lot of clarity. I'm not saying it clarifies everything and we never feel any tension, but I think it's a good place to start. When we approach this topic uh, as an issue, it's easy to demonize people who are different from us or someone that we don't understand. And unfortunately, the church has done that in the past. Um, We have seen the church um, demonize people that were different, divorced people, gay people, addicts. The church has a track record of people who are different, who feel on the outside uh, like they are getting beaten up. And, um, but I want to start in this place, and I want to get an amen from this. If you're human, God loves you. Can I get an amen to that? If you are human, you're made in the image of God, you're valuable because you're God's, God loves you. And I think that we get clarity from that. Now, it doesn't make the conversations we're getting ready to have easier, but I think it puts the temperature in the room at a different place than us going, well, what's, let's get, pick a position, pick a position. Um, With that as our starting place, does the Bible talk about same-sex behavior? Yeah, it does. actually does. And some people are surprised by that. Now, other people are surprised by the fact that there's only five or six passages in the Bible that talk about homosexuality. And there's a good amount of debate over how many of those texts apply to what we see today being monogamous, same-sex, consensual relationships. A lot of people talk about Genesis 19. In this story, some men in the city of Sodom come banging on a guy named Lot's door. They're banging on the door. They're surrounding his house because, and I hate to be graphic here, but they want to gang rape the guests that are in his home. And what they don't know is that the guests in his home are angels. And so they're banging on the door, banging on the door. And a lot of people like to use this passage against homosexuality as a passage to to fight against uh, that. Uh, But the truth is, this passage really isn't about that. Um, In fact, throughout the rest of the Bible, uh, when there's mention of Sodom and Gomorrah, it it really has nothing to do with homosexuality. Um, So while it's an important story, an interesting story, it's not one that connects with the conversation we're having here today. Now, Leviticus 18 and 20 are very different. Uh, Leviticus 18 and 20 are very clear and direct uh, in their prohibition of same-sex sexual behavior of any kind. Now, some people might say, well, this is the Old Testament, right? And, I mean, Jesus does away with the Old Testament, you know? I mean, there's a lot of things that we find in Leviticus that aren't, you know, that that are replaced with Jesus. And the the truth is that that there's a degree of truth with that. Jesus seemingly sets aside some of the things like the sacrificial system and dietary laws um, uh, that uh, are different now that Jesus has hit the scene. But I would say that the majority of the prescriptions that are given in the Old Testament are what I would call timeless moral principles. They're things that carry over from Old Testament to New, and they carry over to today's life. I think all of us would say that incest is a bad thing. Adultery is a bad thing. Child sacrifice, bestiality, lying and stealing. There's ethics that are carried over from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And so what we see is the sexual ethics from the Old Testament are still in place. And many of them are repeated by New Testament authors, which we'll look at in a sec. So it's hard to wave away Leviticus 18 and 20. We can't just say, well, it's the Old Testament, uh, because it's mentioned in the New. Um, Is it true that Jesus did not teach explicitly on homosexuality? Yes, that is true. Nowhere in the the Gospels does Jesus uh, explicitly address same-sex sexual behavior. But we shouldn't take too much from Jesus' silence in the positive or negative sense. The truth was Jesus was a Jew. He was a faithful Jew who had traditions of the Jewish faith. And so we cannot make too much or too little of Jesus' silence because there's things that Jesus didn't talk about, like rape, that we know the Bible clearly speaks about. Um, Romans 1 is by far uh, the strongest example in the Old Testament that, that uh, shares about homosexuality. Um, Romans 1, if I could give you a Spark Notes version of it, um, basically says God created us, and he created us to thrive and to have a good life, to, to flourish. 
And he says that same-sex sexual behavior goes against that design of God's. Um, it's one of the ways that human beings have been given over, that's the terminology that Paul uses, to rebel against God, God's best intentions for the way of life uh, that he has designed. Now, a lot of Christians stop here. And we go, here's, here's my example right now. Homosexuality is bad. I've got it in my hands. But I want to be really clear that the point of Romans 1 isn't to condemn gay people. It's not like Paul said, I'm just going to take a whole chapter con- to condemn gay people. It's not what he did. It's actually, Romans 1 is, is used to help us all understand that we're all sinners. Like all of us. Amen. Every single one of us is a sinner. And this is often, let me just be really blunt, okay? Um, this is often missed by homophobic Christians who use this passage as a weapon against someone uh, that they're trying to convince of their views of homosexuality. This passage reminds us that all of us, all of us rebel against God's best intentions for our lives. All of us are beggars looking for bread. In Romans 1, included in the list of ways that we are alienated from God, we alienate ourselves from God, included in that list are greed, envy, murder, strife, malice, dishonesty, slander, hating God, arrogance, disobedience to parents, and not demonstrating faith. Is there anybody in here who can raise their hand and say, I've never done any of that? Right? You ever gossiped about somebody else? Not been fully transparent or honest? You ever gone through a season where you hated God? You are frustrated with God? You ever carried yourself with arrogance or disobeyed your parents? I mean, it's, it's, Paul's working really hard to say, all of us rebel against God's best intentions for our lives. And until we see that as the main point of this passage, we'll continue to use it as ammo against other people. Um, as I said before, the truth is all of us are beggars looking for bread, every single one of us. And if we approach the Christian faith with this arrogance and go, no, no, I mean, I, I mostly put my life together and God's kind of helped out a bit, but I'm mostly together. We miss the point of what Paul says. Just a few chapters later, Romans 3, he says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are beggars looking for bread. And if you find bread, friends, what Paul says is you share that bread with other people. You share what Jesus has done with other people. That's what the whole book of Romans is about. That's why it's such a beautiful book. It's because it it helps us to realize all of us, even though we were sinners, Thanks be to God that he sent Jesus on the cross and raised from the dead that we could have our shame and our sinfulness crucified to the cross and we could live resurrected lives with hope, right? Amen. Isn't that hopeful? Isn't that good news to every person? And in light of what God's done, in light of what God has done for us, we respond by giving our whole lives, and that includes our bodies, to the work of Jesus as a living sacrifice. So when we look at what the Bible does say, does it address homosexual behavior? Yes, it does. And from the Bible, it is hard to find any sort of endorsement for same sexual behavior, same sex sexual behavior as God's design for our best sexuality. Now I know um, that that's a hard word for some people. Um, the truth is, this topic, Becky and I have gone back and forth talking about it because we have friends that are, that are gay that are close to us, and so we, we struggle with it even internally within our home. We wrestle back and forth and pray, and um, whether you have, had, uh, you have had a same-sex attraction or you love someone who's gay, this word challenges us, and it, it's, it's hard uh, to hear this. Uh, so what do we do with this? Is this simply some issue that we go, okay, now we know what it is about, um, I don't think so. I want to take a few moments just to discuss, in light of this, what it looks like to live like Jesus and carry the spirit of Jesus with us as we leave from here. Whether you have a same-sex attraction uh, or, you know, your loved one does or you struggle with how to respond to people who are gay, we want to figure out what it looks like to live like Jesus and not just be kind of political agents who go, I've got to decide. I've to. We want to live like Jesus. So I want to go through a few things um, and then... Um, we will close our time together. But when I think of this, I'm reminded of how Jesus acted around people who the crowds thought were unlovable. I'm just reminded of this story in Matthew 9. Uh, if you've got a Bible, take a look. Matthew 9, I uh, will pick up in verse 9. 
It says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Excuse me. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But you need to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I've not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call the sinner. I don't know about you, but I am left just saying, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, because the truth is, I know that my sin is great, but Jesus is greater. And I think from this story, we miss the shockwaves of what would have happened to Matthew, right? We, we go, most of us today, we don't like tax collectors, right? The IRS comes knocking, and we're like, oh, I don't like this, right? They're kind of getting in my business. But it's different in those days. See, they didn't just have this kind of like, eh, I don't like tax collectors. They saw tax collectors as these sellouts to the Roman government. I mean, Matthew gave himself out to the evil empire. He sold out. He was committing religious treason. I mean, think about this. If God's love had a leash, it extended almost to the tax collectors, but not that far. Like it was right there. It was, had its full tension right before it got the tax collectors. And how does Jesus respond to this tax collector named Matthew? Come and follow me. You know, I think that at times we feel this tension to be judge, jury, and executioner. We feel like it's our job to put this mantle on our shoulders and to have all the questions and answered and everything figured out. And I think there's a simplicity that comes with us just saying amazing things happen when we let Jesus get with people from all different backgrounds, from all different bruises and scrapes and scars and languages and nations. When Jesus collides with people, amazing things happen. And I am convinced now more than ever that these are the words that we have to, as a church, say to anyone who walks in the doors of River Tree. Come, follow Jesus. The truth is, all of us have our pet sins. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to, you know, it's, it's easy to elevate some sins and, you know, uh, kind of diminish the sins that we have. But even all of us who come in with our pet sins, Jesus says to us, come and follow me. Follow me. And I just think every person who collided with Jesus when he was walking on the earth knew that he loved them. But friends, I want you to know this because I know this to be true. Every gay person who walks the earth today does not know that Jesus loves them. They don't. And I think a lot of that is because of the way that Christians in the church have treated people who have same-sex attraction, who've come out as gay. And I think that we have done a disservice. Not saying that we, and we'll talk about this in a sec, it doesn't mean that we have to accept everything that a person's done, but I think one of the things that we can start to do is build relationships and ensure that as we're faithful to God's word, we're not swerving on that. We're faithful to God's word that, the, that, that God's design is heterosexual marriage. That's God's design. But how amazing would it be if every single person knew that Jesus loved them, that they were loved by Jesus and loved by us, Truth and love are not mutually exclusive. We try to separate them at times. We've got to beat them down with the truth. Or, well, we can't really, we can't really share Jesus with them. No, Jesus did that perfectly, didn't he? He was able to love people well, but he, he didn't irk from the truth. He was very clear with people. I love the way that Billy Graham puts kind of how to respond in these circumstances. He says, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict, God's job to judge, and my job to love. And I think, man, coming from Billy Graham, that kind of takes a bit of a pressure off me, you know? I feel like I've got to have all the answers and figure everything out and know how to, you know, all these things. And I think that we just have to understand that accepting someone does not mean accepting everything they've done. Accepting someone, loving someone, does not mean accepting every single action they have done. We're all loved and we're all broken. Can I get an amen to that, right? all loved, and all of us are broken, and it's part of the journey of making Jesus your Lord and Savior, is learning to submit all the parts of your life, and yes, your sexuality, 
submitting that to the lordship of Jesus. So whether you're single, married, gay, straight, we're all called to find God-honoring expressions of our sexuality in God-intended design. And from the scriptures, this God-honoring sexuality is found in heterosexual marriage. And it's very clear. It's not ambiguous. But all of us are held to that standard, every single one of us. And if we're honest, and again, I would say most, if not all of us, can look back at seasons of our life where we did not live up to the God's standard of sexuality. Every single one of us can look back at portions of our life where maybe we settled into lust or adultery or something else and we allowed some part of our life to be manipulated or twisted or turned. And so I just think that there's a level of humility we have to enter into this with knowing that we're all loved by Jesus and we're all broken and we're all on a journey together. And Jesus loves us just as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us where we are. And so the conversations I have with my friends who are gay is kind of what direction are you uh, going in? Are you, are you moving in the direction of following Jesus or is someone just go, I don't really care? I think it's a great conversation for us to have with people from all different backgrounds and all different sins and all different, all kinds of things is just be able to say, what direction are you moving? Are you making Jesus the Lord of your life every single day? Are you submitting more of your life to Jesus? And we just help people collide with Jesus. So I think that at the end of the day, everybody's loved, but no one is indulged. Every single person is challenged. Um, so let me just say a few things and then I don't know, I don't even know what time it is. Um, are we okay? Are people waiting out lobby? Okay. Um, so if I'm gay, am I welcome at River Tree? Yes. Last I checked, I don't stand at the door and screen people for their sins. Um, and I think if we did that, uh, this would be a pretty lonely place and I would be out of job, right? Um, this would be a really, really quiet place on a Sunday morning. Um, I, I don't, the truth is, I don't care who you are. God loves you. God wants a relationship with you, and there is no one beyond the reach of God's love. Amen? Amen. And so um, I know that doesn't solve every question. Um, I know it doesn't uh, resolve every tension, but I think it points us in the right direction. Um, so here's what I want to do. Um, I want to pray, and I just want to say uh, I am excited about this series. I hope you're as excited as I am about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but um, I am I'm excited to be able to answer more of your questions and address and be able to talk openly and honestly. And I'm um, really excited for what God will do. So I just want to pray. And, um, and what we'll do is we're going to pray and then we're going to take time to celebrate communion. And I think it just fits perfectly with us being able to celebrate God's grace and love towards all of us in communion. And uh, so I'll pray and then we'll have our service come forward for communion. Let's pray together. God, uh, we submit these two questions to you and we pray um, that you would give us wisdom and discernment and courage to live like Jesus, to be faithful to your word, uh, to be faithful to the, the, the path of Jesus, to be loving and kind and good. Um, and so we pray, God, uh, that uh, you would humble our hearts and help us to embody Jesus more and more every day. And uh, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you are a God of grace and love and compassion towards us. And uh, we just pray that our hearts as we celebrate communion would, uh, would be centered on that. We pray this in Jesus' name.